right, so thank you everyone for coming. A uh, special thank you to my committee, Dr. Ursoy, Dr. Haynes, Dr. Hankins, and Dr. Mihalike, and the honorary member of my committee, the soon to be Dr. Garner. I would also like to extend my gratitude to my mentors and friends who are, he who are here today. And thank you to the Book of Oblivion community for your support, especially because you hear me talk about these ideas every chance I get. I also want to thank my mom for being here. Not only did she teach me to read, she and my father are constant supports. And last but not least, my husband, Bruce, who is an incredible human and never says no when I tell him I need another bookshelf. Okay, it is a great honor and privilege to share this project with you all. My name is Jessica Shad Manuel. I am a first generation college student who went to school on an athletic scholarship. Back then I could sound out words, but I didn't know how to read. In addition to having incredible teachers, professors, and mentors along the way, I have spent the last 20 years compensating for the comprehension skills I lacked. As a consequence, I have come to some pretty profound realizations about what it means to read. I have a BA in English, an MA in literature, and have spent the last 12 years teaching reading and writing at the college level. Eight years ago, I started a public humanities project called Book Oblivion, that has turned into a worldwide community of readers uh, and offers online courses in the area of literature and philosophy. So today I will defend the ideas I put forth in my manuscript, but I would like to start by saying that my idea of a defense is one of protection and care. What I have written is a labor of love and my goal today is to communicate how I have come to honor and care for my reading practice and the practice of my students, my family, my friends, and the worldwide community of readers I am a part of. The first thing I invite you to do is join me in transforming 1984. Please inhale. The year is 1984. George Orwell's dystopian future has arrived. Ronald Reagan is president elect and Wes Craven's nightmare occupies Elm Street. Not only is it a leap year, but it is the year of the rat, according to the Chinese Zodiac. Haruki Murakami places the finishing touches on his fourth novel, Hard Boiled Wonderland and the End of the World. Trevor Noah is born a crime under the apartheid regime in South Africa. Prince crawls across the stage of purple violets in the music video for Billboard's number one song, When Doves Cry. Yugoslavia hosts the Winter Olympics and people worldwide gather in Los Angeles to watch athletes compete in the Summer Olympics. William Gibson's debut cyberpunk novel, Neuromancer, hits the shelves. Oprah Winfrey relocates to Chicago to host her first talk show. Across Lake Michigan, the Detroit Tigers defeat the San Diego Padres in Game 5 of the World Series. Mary Oliver wins the Pulitzer Prize for Literature for her collection of poems, American Primitive. Just outside the atmosphere, American astronauts Bruce McCandless II and Robert Stewart take a five hour walk, spacewalk untethered for the first time. A poet and member of the Muskegee Nation, Joy Harjo, takes home the honor of outstanding young women of America at 33 years old. Architect R Richard Saul Werman hosts the first TED conference in Monterey, California. Down the street, after seven years of construction, the Monterey Bay Aquarium opens its doors on Cannery Row. Just north on the 101, Steve Wozniak attends the first Hackers Conference in Marin County that is organized in response to Stephen Levy's book, Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution. On the other side of the country, the Los Angeles Raiders dominate the Washington Redskins in Tampa, Florida for Super Bowl 18. The same Super Bowl that airs Apple's famous commercial promising to revolutionize technology so that 1984 won't be like 1984. As Apple connects technological innovation to individual genius to inspire cultural consumption that will transform the way we live and breathe and see the world, an early precursor to the iPhone is unearthed halfway around the world. Archaeologists discover two small unbaked clay tablets in Talbrak, Syria. 
these small stone slabs predate the iPhone by approximately 6,000 years and are thought to carry some of the earliest written inscriptions. Housed in the Archaeological Museum of Baghdad, Argentine Canadian author Alberto Manguel, a writer, a translator, an editor, an anthologist, a library director, and devoted reader, who also happened to be friends with the Argentine writer Jorge Luis Borges, will visit these clay tablets five years from now in 1989. Inscribed upon these tablets are depictions of one goat and one sheep with a marking thought to signal the number 10. Manguel traces the origins of writing to these tablets that farmers use to communicate the quantity of livestock. In A History of Reading, which isn't written yet, but it will be soon, uh, he explains why the discovery of these tablets was so profound. Quote, by the mere fact of looking at these tablets, we have prolonged a memory from the beginning of our time, preserved a thought long after the thinker has stopped thinking, and made ourselves participants in the act of creation that remains open for as long as the incised images are seen, deciphered, and read, end quote. He recognizes that reading is participatory, but by tracing the act of reading to those tablets, he ties the future and fate of reading to what I consider its demise, utility. Tracing the history of these tablets, um, of reading to these tablets, affirms Plato's fears articulated in the dialogue between Socrates and Phaedrus that writing externalizes memory and hinders remembering. The more I consider Plato's concerns, which are often dismissed for being Luddite, the more I realize how radically his fears have been realized. Writing does externalize memories, but that is not necessarily the problem. His concern was less about technology, the technology of writing, and more about the use and the misuse of it. He differentiates reminding from remembering, insisting that writing remedies the former but hinders the latter. He feared this new technology called writing will give the appearance of wisdom but will not foster authentic learning. Plato says philosophy begins in wonder. Similarly, I think reading is an act of perception that begins in wonder and leads to wisdom. It is not a response to writing, but a responsibility we have to interact with the world, the world around us and the phenomena before us. Had Plato understood the reader's power to internalize writing as phenomena in a way that transforms how we how the reader lives and creates culture, he might have felt differently about the technology of writing. He might have realized that reading with the body leads to wisdom, and when we participate in our existence by being in the world, we are reading. So what is reading? Reading is making. We make connections and we form relationships. In his book, Attunement, Architectural Meaning After the Crisis of Modern Science, architect Alberto Perez Gomez describes how a visitor transforms space every time she visits it, just like the reader renews a poem every time she reads it. The relationship between the reader and her text is marked by a mutual transformation, one that we can characterize by breath, inhalation, and exhalation. Irish philosopher Richard Kearney likens the reading experience to a double movement of Janus simultaneously facing two directions. In one direction, back toward what is revealed, and forward toward the language that does the revealing in the other. Janus was the Roman god whose name meant passage or doorway and whose presence symbolized beginnings and endings. The reader, like Janus, enacts the double movement. Kearney takes it one step beyond bodily orientation when he acknowledges that this movement happens at the level of language. The word is flesh. Readers touch the text and are touched in return. As the reader creates the meaning of the text, new horizons emerge. Gail Wise teaches us that the body is a narrative horizon, and I've come to realize that the body of a text has its own narrative horizons. The double movement that Janus represents further manifests in our relationship to memory and place. Echoing Heraclitus, we never enter the same river twice, not only because we have changed, the river, like the text, remembers us. While some thinkers are more willing to acknowledge the transformative potential of energy in places, uh, I am advocating for this same recognition in written texts. We read to remember. Memories do not stand still, but lead the reader toward the wisdom that carries the past into the present moment while facing forward to the future to build a better world. 
it is still 1984. Kronos and Kairos have nothing on Janus. As I transform from an embryo to a fetus in my mother's womb in the Sierra Nevada mountains, a 37-year-old Cynthia Haynes attends her first doctoral seminar under the guidance of Victor Vitanza. The course is titled, titled Rhetorics of Reading and is held in room 201 of College Hall at the University of Texas at Arlington on Thursday nights. This course lays the foundation for creative thinking and writing that begets the doctoral program in rhetorics, communication, and information design at Clemson University 20 years from now. I will complete this program at the same age as Cynthia in 37 years by asking a question hidden in the cells of its genesis. How do we read in a meaningful way? I invite you to listen untethered as I demonstrate what it means to read toward breath in our contemporary cultural moment so that 1984 won't be like 1984. Okay, so welcome back to the present moment. <laughs> what I will do next is give you a brief overview of my dissertation. Jorge Luis Borges calls the book an axis of innumerable relationships. Instead of focusing on the book as the axis point, this project explores the reader the embodied human as an access of countless relationships between intertwining phenomena. I attend to, to the complexities of the reader's relationship with visible and invisible energies that intersect the imagination, the author, the text, the world, and the community to enrich the reading experience, but also to see what it takes to read in a meaningful way. This richness will increase energy, expand consciousness, inspire reciprocity within the reading relationship and perpetuate enlivenment. Throughout my dissertation, I aim to open up our thinking about the activity of reading to recover a loving, creative relationship with the text. I see a critical need for an ecology of reading that allows readers to combine energies from their memories and imagination and the wisdom of everyday experience to build new worlds in response to texts. My project explores life-giving answers to a few central questions. What happens when we pursue a reading practice that highlights the embodied reader as an access of innumerable relationships between the book, our memories, our imagination, the author, our communities, and the world? How might a reading practice that attends to details, delights in ambiguities, and moves with culture foster meaningful connections between reader and phenomena? Can readers respond to ambiguity with existential courage instead of despair? Can we relate to, to create, can we read to create culture instead of destroying it? How does the convergence of knowing, doing, and making change our experience of the book? What happens after we close the book? How can I encourage my students to love reading? And perhaps most importantly and centrally, and again, how do we read in a meaningful way? My research focuses on three related areas of inquiry um, called phenomenologies of perception and reading, carnal hermeneutics, and narrative architectures. My unique contribution combines several phenomen phenomenological approaches to offer an alternative approach to reading. I seek to communicate a creative reading posture that generates wonder and leads to wisdom to help my readers recognize how to read in a more meaningful life-giving way. The organization of my dissertation mirrors my reading practice, which I liken to breath. My manuscript consists of six chapters you see here, Transforming 1984, Reading Matters, Inhalation, Transformation, Exhalation, and Bated Breath. Before I give you an overview of each chapter, I want to mention a few key terms, figures, and overarching ideas. I turn from regarding the book as an abstract or static representation of thought or memory to embracing it as a text that weaves together a plurality of voices. The word text includes the etymological associations of weaving and weaving a tapestry and communicates the way a book contains communicative relationships. This is why you will most often hear me call what we read a text. Throughout my dissertation, I also refer to what we read as phenomena and occasionally interchange these for book, poem, painting, or weather phenomena, depending on the point I make in context. I am particularly interested in the reader's response to and relationship to any given text. I use some terms throughout to communicate the need for readers to enhance their participation with the text. The term participation is one I inherited from Maurice Mulupani, but Mercia 
uh, Eliad and used it before him, and David Abram used it, and Andreas Weber used it after him. Owen Barfield's idea of participation and how it transformed with literate culture is also implied in my approach to participation. Correspondence is another way I characterize this participation, and it effectively communicates the intertwining that occurs when a reader perceives phenomena. Tim Ingold, an anthropologist, uh, it inspired me to include it as part of my lexicon. I like I like it because correspondence also implies reciprocity, which has become increasingly important and crucial to me after appreciating Lucy Arigere's notion of two-ness in 2B2 and Robin Wall Kimmerer's approach to ecology in braiding sweetgrass. Once the reader interacts with the text, a mystical or po poetic dilation occurs. This idea stems from Jean-Louis Cretien, who builds on Augustine. Dilation is expansion, and this idea parallels Ricoeur's theories of narrative time, which contains an expansive notion of time and space. So the first chapter is transforming 1984 and functions as an introduction to the rest of the dissertation. In this section, I practice a creative reading strategy that focuses on the year 1984 as my creative heuristic. You heard most of the creative elements of this a few moments ago. I knew 1984 would work for several reasons, but my innovation was a response to tasting and reading several nuggets of knowledge that converged in that year. When I read about the archeological dig that unearthed those two clay tablets in Talabrak, Syria, I felt disappointed that Alberto Manguel ties the earliest written inscriptions to use when I think it would be more appropriate to tie, to tie them or link them to making. I believe transforming the history of reading discovered in 1984 is the start of changing our orientation to reading. So my research in the area of reading explores the themes of knowledge, information, memory, existence, and all of these emerge in George Orwell's novel, 1984. Because this year is already part of our cultural imagination, I knew I could use it to connect and relate the clues I found to introduce the main ideas I discuss. The intersections of my biographical and biological self alongside the genesis of the program here at Clemson were epiphanic moments, gifts that keep on giving. It was only yesterday that I realized that I am the same age as Cynthia was when she was sitting under Victor, Vitan Victor Vitanza's teachings while they discussed their relationship to reading. My attention to details and moments of discovery demonstrate how I participate in reading and how any experience I have with a text combines influences across space and time. The next chapter is called Reading Matters. Owen Barfield considers words fossils of consciousness. With this in mind, my second chapter is Reading Matters. In this chapter, I communicate that reading matters in every way, both figuratively in terms of where we place our value and literally in the sense that what we transform, uh, what we read transforms us at a cellular level inside our bodies. Throughout this chapter, I establish the rhetorical situation by first describing why there's a problem with our current approach to reading. I focus on the educational institution and show how we prioritize information at the expense of experience and observation. I illustrate these priorities by pointing to the Department of Education's standardized tests and academic standards. I also tell a story about one of my first composition students who continues to haunt me because uh, of the way he told me 10 years ago, over 10 years ago, about how he hates reading. I argue our current approach to reading leads to stasis, disconnection, or fusion, ideas I loosely associate with death, the death of the reader. At the institutional level, educators advocate for a posture of reading that leads to extracting information from a text, and they call this learning. This is more or less requ required because of how standardized tests measure progress in this area. California State Board of Education publishes content standards for language arts for each grade level and foregrounds reading as a transaction. The third requirement for kindergartners requires five-year-olds to demonstrate that they understand that printed materials provide information. The emphasis on information is why reading comprehension is central to reading education. Standardized tests measure the amount of information taught and not forgotten. This information is primarily factual or declarative knowledge and answers questions like who, what, where, when. The brain stores information in short-term memory, an economic term we also call working memory. When we design our tests to measure the amount of information a student knows as though it were a capital being stored, we prioritize a focus on declarative knowledge, which cuts the learning process short. 
This approach prioritizes reading as a cognitive exercise instead of an existential experience, something I complicate uh, in a later chapter. The problem here is that we strictly asso associate reading with getting information. We only need the information to answer the questions on the test, and uh, that test is designed to measure how much we have acquired. This transaction is not education. It is a futile process that leaves students feeling isolated, disconnected, and stagnant. And more than that, it leads to forgetting the information in the first place. In George Orwell's 1984, the citizen, citizens of Oceana must place all written documents in small shoots on their walls. These openings are called memory holes and connect to an incinerator. The totalitarian government requires its citizens to erase external memories by throwing them away in these holes. What is striking to me is that this mandate is based on the same logic as our current educational system. These written documents are equated with history as well as memory. That is precisely what makes it so violating for the reader to witness citizens throw away aspects of their individuality and free thinking along with the histories of their culture. The absolute terror in the scene is that we equate memory with information. Our current cultural crisis concerning information points to the same posture. Instead of eliminating information, citizens face misinformation and disinformation challenges and always destabilizing the reader. This instability and confusion are why war efforts continue to shift to the information environment. If the enemy sows seeds of discord and increases polarization within a culture, then apprehending information is no longer about what is true or false. Like a soldier in Vietnam, we can't hear past the explosion. We misplace our priorities if we focus entirely on designing information for better understanding or complicating it for war efforts. When we approach reading as a means to an end, which is what we do when we focus on comprehending information, then we forfeit the transformative possibilities that information has the potential to offer when we live and breathe with it. Not only that, but this approach is not adequate for learning. The information heavy short term memories we make when reading a text are most frequently forgotten unless transferred to long term memory. When we focus on information, we, we become obsessed with efficiency. So misinformation and disinformation are, most, are the most significant obstacles to reading efficiently as long as the goal is to acquire knowledge. Once again, learning this way becomes a transaction, transaction and sadly, the payoff is cut short. So there's nothing wrong with information. Whether that information communicates the amount of livestock a farmer has or instructs a child on where to hang their backpack, printed materials do provide information. This information is often helpful and even inspires citizens to rebel against Big Brother. That usefulness is cut short when the standardized test is at the end of the line. To transfer information from our short-term working memory to our long-term memory, we must first process information with our senses and integrate that experience into our lives. We must hear past the explosion. We do this by connecting to previous knowledge and experience, which is impossible when we stop at information as though building up an arsenal of, arsenal of facts is an end in itself. I more or less just described the current state of the problem. So where does it come from? I argue this orientation toward death results from a reading approach concerned with cognitively processing the information as though our cognitive awareness were separate from our body. I discuss the correlation between sight-oriented perception and how prioritizing the sense of sight limits epistemology by correlating truth with certainty. An example of this is when the architecture professor and musician, Rachel McCann, advocates for an embodied experience of architecture and only reinforces the problem when she critiques reading to privilege embodied experience. Quote, vision and language have traditionally been primary vehicles through which Western culture seeks, seeks to domesticate the sensuous world. And architectural pedagogy has long been com complicit in this effort, training architects to produce buildings to be read and interpreted rather than experienced, end quote. While I agree with McCann that architecture would benefit from a more embodied approach, reading is not her opposition. The ontologies of reading and architecture suffer from similar site-oriented epistemologies, but interacting with a book, just like a building, is always an embodied experience. We have lost touch with this reality, just like we have lost the inherent dynamism in the concept of truth. I offer a correction that celebrates and recovers a multi-sensory interaction with phenomena. 
I discuss how cognition is always embodied and an intimate part of our bodily experience by pointing to how readers make meaning in space, through time, and between two unique existences. I add complexity to this problem by showing that the answer is not found by fusing ourselves with the text, a strategy that earlier phenomenologists of reading practiced. Instead of advancing the favorite approach of fusion, I advocate for an ecological relationship with the text that maintains the integrity of two unique existences. This chapter establishes a call to enhance our connection to information or phenomena. I propose one particular path as a solution or a response to this call, and I flesh that out through the rest of my dissertation. The corrective that I identify in chapter two is fortifying our relationship to the text and phenomena in general. In other words, we need to strengthen our relationship with texts that we read. If reading is about relationships, the next question is, what does that relationship look like and how do we strengthen it? The remaining chapters of my dissertation further articulate and enact that renewed approach. I consider reading an act of perception. The Latin term perceptio implies gathering and receiving, and this definition is how people conceive of reading, typically. It's all input and it's primarily received through the sense of sight. Perception has evolved from these etymological implications and now includes organizing, identifying, and interpreting a sensation to form mental representations. Sense is a felt bodily experience and concerns how bodies interact with the world. Perception includes the reception of sensory information and applies, implies arranging that information, which means it is both receptive and creative. This definition aligns with the writings of French phenomenologist Maurice Mulupani, who clarifies that perception takes place between two distinct but intertwining phenomena. The intertwining is a relationship characterized characterized by reciprocity, a rich reciprocity that leads to mutual transformation. Perception is a relationship. Our conception of perception has evolved, but we need our concept of reading to do the same. The act of reading is more than a cognitive process and even surpasses the phenomenological encounter. My research describes the reader's relationship to the text as an act of perception that includes both reception, the receiving of input, transformation, the interaction with phenomena, and creation, the making of meaning. Reading includes several registers of perception, including, but not limited to, encounters of and with sensation, language, imagination, music, and nature. How we orient ourselves to these activities in space and time determines how we read, breathe, and live. I use the metaphor of breath to help my reader imagine the kind of relationship to reading that I'm after. Breath becomes a guiding image to describe the reading process. Breathing is the quintessential primordial gesture, as Lucy Arigure affirms. Breathing is a continuing action that coincides with life itself. When we remember our breath, we are reminded of our autonomy and our interdependence at the same time. Reading and breath operate with a rhythmic exchange of energy characterized by inhalation and exhalation. Every breath we take fulfills the biological necessity of bringing air into the lungs and exchanging it for a gas that we then send back out into the world. At the same time that we appreciate the biological necessity of our bodies transforming oxygen into carbon dioxide, we recognize the symbolic resonance that breath offers to our existence. The breath metaphor also sets up the body chapters of my project, which ref reflect the process of inhalation, transformation, and exhalation. Chapter three focuses on inhalation. What I do here is demonstrate that receptive and creative functions of memory and imagination at work in the reading process. They begin with inhalation or receiving input, and then I advocate for an inclination toward phenomena that we read. I use the term inclination to describe the posture of the reader willing to participate in receiving and creating the text. She is open to the life-giving, wonder-inducing experiences of reading. It is not only an inclination to the text that I am after, but an inclination to a life of varied backgrounds and rich connections. This posture is hospitable in the sense that 
It welcomes all walks of life from a variety of backgrounds and would inspire more diverse interpretations. The term inclination comes from Italian philosopher Adriana Cavarero. She uses it to correct the erect posture inherited from an epistemological and ontolo ontological disposition built on certainty. Inclining ourselves to the text often induces wonder and leads to transformation. This chapter establishes the need to turn matter into memory. Remembering is the ability to integrate meaning into our lives by composing a narrative and is critical for creative expression. This is part of what it takes to read in a meaningful way. I talk, I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> okay, in chapter four, I'm sorry, I'm gonna cut this short. You know this is abbreviated, it's several hundred pages. In chapter four, I discuss the particularities of those transformative pot potentials. Once again, reading is like breathing, it is a metabolic process wherein the body changes, but the body is always in the world. Reading is not just a passive experience based on reception of a text or inhalation of air. A transformation takes place, and as a result, what we exhale changes the air around us. The relationship between the reader and her text is marked by mutual transformation and is characterized by interacting with phenomena and integrating the memories of those interactions into our lives. Reading transforms us and in turn, we transform the world. The body is a threshold where the transformation takes place. Okay, the collect, uh, we are prone, I'm not gonna skip, okay. Whether returning from a journey or preparing for a new one, we inhale a process, uh, we inhale and process the air in our bodies. With reading, this process includes interacting with phenomena through attention and touch and integrating those phenomenal experiences into our lives in the form of memory. We are prone to ontological insecurity without the ability to integrate those experiences. The collection of essays edited by Richard Kearney and Brian Trainer titled Colonel Hermeneutics advances Maurice Malupani's phenomenology alongside Paul Ricoeur's phenomenological hermeneutics. My work is greatly influenced by theirs. This chapter builds on the ideas, uh, their ideas and explores the metabolic and symbolic transformations that occur when reading with a multi-sensory approach to the text and being attuned to the environment. The narrative we create to process our experiences is the design we communicate and share, which leads us to exhalation. Exhalation describes the way we transform the world. It is not the end, but it culminates the reading process before we take our next breath. This is where the reader responds with innovation. I consider reading like breath a poetic act. We read to make the world and we communicate our creations with each other through conversation, education, architecture, and more. We relate narratives and cultivate humanity, all because we share the air with our text and we live with one another. This is a natural response to reading, but I see profound benefits to exhaling on purpose. One way I guide readers through this process of exhalation is by creating something ta tactile in response to the text. This chapter brings Paul Ricoeur's ideas in architecture and narrativity into conversation with Kojin Karatani's ideas on the will to architecture. What I emphasize here is that reading results in making, and in that way, it is a poetic act. Chapter six, my final chapter, is called Bated Breath. It expands the theories I articulate in the previous chapters, and uh, it conceptualizes what it means to read for life, and that is by relating reading to breathing. Breathing and reading are similar processes in that they are simultaneously material, spiritual, imaginative, symbolic, metaphorical, and biological. This chapter functions as an application, though it continues to weave in theoretical insights and adds complexity to my argument. Our relationship to breath is like a relationship to reading in that the process starts by bringing the text inside our body. A transformation takes place and then the text influences our daily lives. Finally, it manifests in the world around us. It is an event in that it takes place in an instant. The Hebrew word debar translates to word and carries the meaning event. Events like words take on meaning with other events or other words. Jean-Louis Cretion emphasizes that the air or space surrounding an event is what gives it its meaning. He says, 
quote, to breathe an event does not mean breathing it as an isolated event. It means breathing the atmosphere and environment in which it unfolds and acquires meaning. It means breathing its connection to other events, end quote. We read texts by bringing them into our bodies through sensory per perception, but the reading process is always in relation to spatiotemporal moments that precede it. The focus is not on consuming information for ourselves, but on attending to and caring for the details of the text while immersing ourselves in the entire event of reading. Each text is enriched and made more meaningful as we consider it alongside the next. Reading is often described as an instrument and sometimes considered technology, but I have yet to see it correspond to something as intimate as breath. This air envelops every textual encounter that we share. As two unique existence, you and I breathe together, one forming the other in a symbiotic relationship. This is precisely what happens when we read. A reading practice that inclines us toward the feeling of being alive starts with breath. We begin with breath, we beget with breath. In Lucy Irigray's The Way of Breath, she calls breath that first autonomous gesture of a living human being. Perhaps reading is a close second. Irigray also says we need to protect our breath and I demonstrate how this sense of maternal care is critical to cultivating a relationship with the text that nourishes us. As readers, we need to turn toward breath. To do this, I offer an, offer an approach that decreases the distance between the reader and her text and emphasizes the formation between two entities. This proximity encourages, encourages connections and relations between two unique existences the reader and her text, ultimately expanding the reader's horizons. This expansion perpetuates life as the reader makes meaning by relating narratives with the text as she moves through space and time. Despite the many mind-blowing inventions over the last eight millennia and the ways they have influenced our conscious awareness, we are, we are tragically unimaginative about the practice of reading. When we conceive of writing the way Socrates does, Socrates does as preservation of artificial memory separated from the body, we forfeit our ability to participate in the simultaneous act of reception and creation that reading is. My dissertation focuses on how we engage information at the lowest point of contact, reading. To read for self-formation is not enough. And ultimately for, um, to read for cultural transformation, we must rediscover what reading is and how to start and start to relate to what we read on purpose. My research describes a critical phenomenological orientation to reading to show how the text shapes consciousness without depriving consciousness of the agency to shape the world. How we orient ourselves in space and time in relation to the text determines how we read for breath instead of death. Reading is an act of perception and movement is the essence of perception, requiring an ongoing relationship with language and the environment that we might liken to correspondence. Correspondence with the text celebrates bodies as narrative horizons woven together by a plurality of voices and experiences. In the same way, the text embodies a plurality of voices. My proposed creative reading practice acknowledges this relationship between the body and voices of the text as an intertwining so that we might embrace the rich perceptual unfolding that occurs in every reading moment. Ultimately, my project cultivates a creative reading posture that celebrates life and the key to life is movement. The last thing I'll say is that when the reader expands her perception and combines wonder and wisdom, the reader experiences mutual transformation with the text, leading to the feeling of being alive. Finally, and most profoundly, reading toward breath continually and perpetually makes us, expands us, and inspires us to create. Thank you again for coming. Before you leave, I have a small request. I would like you to leave a comment in the chat with a book recommendation for me. It can be any book, just something you think I would appreciate or might challenge me or transform me. Thank you. You may exhale. Perfect timing. Thanks, Jessica. And now I think we are open to questions and comments.
I'm on the committee and I'm not supposed to say anything until the private part of our session, but I want to say thank you for the anecdote about 1984 when I started in the graduate program at UT Arlington. I wasn't quite 37, but it doesn't oh, matter. No, I was, I was 32, uh, <clears throat> oh, but that's okay. No, that's okay. Um, it was just uh, very epiphanic for me too. And I had forgotten that I had even told you um, that or provided that syllabus, which I, I guess I did, did I? It was several years ago. Yeah, right, okay. Um, and, and I wrote Charlotte's web in, in the comment because um, this is like a web, you know, of readers. And um, just a week ago today on my 70th birthday, my mother gave me this book, Charlotte's Web, which is from our church library uh, that I grew up in. And in the back are the, the little borrows cards, you know, still there from the 60s when our names were in it which reminded me of Dr. Ursoy's comment about Walter Benjamin um, finding out that um, Siegfried Gideon was uh, reading the same books he was as he was reading uh, in the Paris Library, University Paris Library. This web is just, you know, an enormous and timeless over time web of readers and when you said in the beginning of your introduction, or maybe at the end of the introduction in the in the text itself, I don't think you said it today. You said, "Come, comma, reader, period." And this is really, to me, um, an amazing call. Okay, that small sentence encapsulates what you're doing and who you're calling. And thank you for that. And uh, I felt it and I stopped and I exhaled and inhaled throughout the reading. And I just, just find this project enormously profound and beautiful. And I'll let some others say some things now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Come readers. Jessica, I have a question I could I could offer if you don't mind. Uh, I've I've retired from 35 years of teaching public schools, reading and literature. And I have a very practitioner mind as many public school teachers did. You began your discussion uh, with a correct and righteous attack on the reading strategies uh, employed in the in the schooling. While I'm really compelled by the model as you've outlined it, um, do you address or how might we address uh, as practitioner teachers of, of reading, what, might, what, what must we do differently? Um, it may be that we're caught in a structure of the system as it is, but that being the case, do you offer anything or is that, are we moving outside the range of your, of your discussion? You know, I, I anticipated that question. I wrote things down in answer to it. Uh, I don't talk about it in the dissertation because there's just simply not room. I could, it's another book. Uh, I do think it will be coming. Uh, a couple of things that I do as far as practical application, um, I wanna emphasize that you live and breathe with a text. And so we can't do that in these short moments. We have to spend time with that text. It requires proximity. Educators are creative people and would be able to uh, think of ways to facilitate that experience for their students in ways that I wouldn't be able to because I don't know the students. I think it requires a relationship with the students, which uh, I talk about in the chapter on exhalation. It requires a facilitating environment. So I bring in Winnicott and discuss the idea that you need a safe space and you have to actually know the people that you're talking to and you're with. And we do that within our book oblivion community and we relate things to each other constantly and we build and scaffold and connect and build that web stronger and stronger. So that is an example. Um, a couple other things I do. One of the things we're doing right now in our creative reading course uh, within book oblivion, which I only share that because you're in that and participating. 
Um, one of the things that I've emphasized is how important it is to feel your body in response to reading. And so because we've kind of uh, siphoned it or siloed reading into the head and this cognitive process that we think has nothing to do with the body for so long, I emphasize reading um, as making. And I think that we should start by making some kind of handicraft. I like that you're doing sound and you're exploring uh, these readings through sound. I think as long as we're exploring the sen senses and bringing the body back into that experience, that is what I'm after. So those are a couple of things that I do. I've done this with my own composition students as well. As you know, um, I think the other thing that I would, I haven't talked as much about, I, I skirt around it in my dissertation, but I would like to spend more time developing is just the idea of habit and how we've, we respond to texts and the way that texts remember us is like, we've got these habits and these abilities to live a disciplined life with these books and with these texts. And I think that notion of habit is something that I need to flesh out deeper. Um, but things like never taking two days off in a row, um, reading every day, 30 pages a day, like setting these habits in place, keep yourself in proximity to the text. And I think that's really important. And so as an educator, I offer those kinds of habits to my own students. And that notion of discipline is something I've found really fruitful and it inspires them. And then I guess part of that is making time for the creative response, making time for the response in general. Did that sufficiently answer your question? It, it sure <laughs> does. And the, and the challenge to use your metaphor is uh, we barely sometimes feel we have time to breathe. Uh, so, and that's exactly what you're compelling us to do. So I appreciate that. Well, I do wanna acknowledge that I think it's really hard to scale. And I think that at every institution um, that we try to enact these things, it's really hard to scale. And if you're gonna have those intimate relationships, it's it's difficult. And I, I have not, I don't have an answer to that, but I, I think that that's what the web's about. Like we have our own specific web and maybe that's where our influence lies. I just wanted to make a quick, oh, sorry, Ryan, I didn't mean to cut you no, off. No, go I ahead. I did, dude, I can sit here all day. There you go. <laughs> I mm -hmm. just want to say um, a testament to your project. It's been an honor to read with you for these past couple of years and to see your presentations and see everything grow. And the, um, I'm, I'm, there's a lot of overlap in what you're doing, what I'm kind of looking at with this ancient um, appreciation for breath and, and sound oversight before literacy kind of takes over in the Western world. So, you know, like it's, it's cool that I'm seeing your ideas in the work I'm already studying because that means that you're doing something amazing because I'm in left field studying disability rhetorics and war. So <laughs> you're, you're onto something amazing and I just wanna say it's been an honor. I think that's amazing. I'm excited as your stuff develops. Ryan, what's your question? So I'm actually going to be real serious, but I'm going to, um, I really want to tease you, but I'm not going to, because this is a momentous time and your husband's here and your mom is here and there's no reason they should endure that. But I will stick my thumb in Art's eye a little bit and ask you a question. So hold your breath, right? Pun intended. Um, one of the things I've said to you by way of text, and I want you to touch on it here, it's way outside of your, your focus, but it is related and it is political in nature. Many of the things that are happening in, at least in our country, and, and I can't say this for other places, but it seems to be one of our greatest exports right now, is a certain way of reading. And by that, I don't mean an informational reading. I mean a literalist, originalist reading. We see it in our legal structures all the time right now. What's really celebrated is this to the text, to the text, to the text kind of model. And... Uh, as someone who is left leaning, you know, I'm uh, ex exceedingly worried uh, about the state of human affairs, but I find that to be ultimately rooted in the way people are reading things. Um, and, and this is a prolonged question, but I'm framing it for you so that you have plenty of room to roam. Um, the other question, the other part of that is, uh, you know, in the Twitter sphere, a lot of my neighbors get really upset that they're going to be censored if they say the wrong thing. And I constantly am telling them that the problem is not with who's saying it, but who's reading it. 
there's this general assumption from tech executives that the morons are not the ones talking, but the ones reading it, uh, that they won't completely understand it. And that if something is written in a certain way, that it will be read in another. Can you comment on the role of reading in terms of cultural development at large and whether the capacity to read inflects legal structures and, and if it does, and if it inflects them negatively, what would be your corrective? So I guess maybe let's put it in terms of I, I asthma. Can, I can answer it. You don't have to well, I just, I just want to talk about <laughs> asthma and albuterol. So give me some albuterol <laughs> no, 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 here. No, no, no. Okay, okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. You don't need that, you don't need that. Okay. Um, okay, so one of the things I talk about in the actual dissertation is that the etymology of literature uh, points to law and how we think of like, truth as certainty and the law never moves, the written word never moves, and how I think that's problematic. I use Heidegger's uh, lectures to the University of Freiburg in the early 1940s on Permenides. They're collected in the lecture, the book called Permenides. I use that to sort of flesh that out and this notion that if we return to truth as aletheia, then we can start and change, which is a kind of change in being with the truth. And it relates to distance and time. What that means is that we can actually observe language and the way we observe weather patterns or weather phenomena in nature and we can see it evolve over time and if we don't think it evolves over time then we have these really rigid responses and i think that's what you're uh, sensing with the associations with um, the way certain cultural texts are being read so i really want to see when i say that language is alive that's what i mean it changes it moves it is flesh, it touches us back, it evolves, and we have to see the text evolve in order for our epistemology to evolve. I think our epistemology is stuck with the way that we read our associations with the text. So I think that's a great question. And I, I sort of, I reference it in this, but I don't, I didn't elaborate on it here, partially because in my comprehensive exams that a lot of you joined me for uh, a little over a year ago, I did mention that too. So. I wanted to at least um, try to cover some new ground. It's pretty dense stuff. <laughs> Does that sufficiently answer your question? Do I, I didn't really give you hope though, right? I think no, 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 it's to, fine. Like, treat, treat it like Just nature. To, yeah, don't invite me back into the conversation. It'll keep going, so yeah, I'll take it. Jess, I have a follow-up question on that, if I may. Yeah? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, what I get from listening to you tonight is that this is aimed at an audience. Your, your learning par paradigm is aimed at an audience that is, I won't say disadvantaged, but um, maybe doesn't take to reading uh, straight on. What do you say to the people, not just in legalese, but people who have been in literature uh, and loving literature and have taken to it since Nancy Drew, long before you were born, probably? Um, is this aimed at a specialized uh, audience or is this a general paradigm? That you're talking about this is kind of tricky because when i start talking about reading people tend to mm. feel a little attacked and I, I i'm kind of critiquing something that we all do and then i'm saying that we're doing it wrong mm. so i understand mm. where the question is coming from uh especially from someone who's been a part of conversations uh that love literature and philosophy and ideas and everything else uh so i i say all of that because i do think there is a way to live and breathe with these ideas in a richer way that uh, that everyone has the chance to practice and improve. So it, even though a lot of this is geared toward maybe educators to some extent and the ability to sort of facilitate this process, the educators are often the exception. And um, especially like you are a, you have your MA in literature, like all through those classrooms and um, whatnot, when we talk about teaching these things, that was something that came up a lot is like, you're the exception to the rule. Like that's not what the average reader, that's not how they will respond. Mm -hmm. And so you would, I think be considered the exception, but I say that 
because I'm still learning how to read and practice and protect my own breath and my own reading practice. And so I think that we all could develop a richer uh, kinship to language. And that is what I'm after. And that is what I hope everybody else would be inspired to pursue as a result of reading my work. This is a totally inappropriate follow-up and you can say, I'll respond to this later. You mentioned um, that you didn't read until quite late. Why was that? Well, let me correct that. Um, I did read, I learned to read when I was four. When I say mm -hmm. I started college and I didn't know how to read, I mean in this really rich way. And so in pursuing mm -hmm. reading comprehension, just your typical reading comprehension, uh, I started to compensate and learn strategies, learning strategies. I studied neuroscience. I started to pursue how to actually get my brain to respond and like actually register information and um, absorb it. And so that's part of what has, how this project has evolved. So my mother, God bless her, has <laughs> taught me to read at a very young age. Hey, and, mom. Uh, I know, hey, mom. So that, uh, yeah. Noah, you have your hand raised. Let's go your, you next. Um, well, first of all, um, it, it's wonderful to be here, Jessica. I, I am so happy and proud of you. Um, as you know, I've been with you along this journey this entire way and appreciate um, your transformation throughout your PhD journey um, and how you have impacted me. So first of all, thank you. Um, in your um, framing of creative reading, um, you talk about it as a life-giving um, communicative process. How might this be impacted when we read texts that might be more negative, that we cannot connect with, um, that people do not finish? Does this help to create connections to the text that we might not otherwise want to connect with? Or are we still transformed even if it isn't necessarily life-giving? Well, that's interesting. Um, I will defer to Michelle Henry's notion of life, which is always a uh, connection between joy and suffering. And I thank Ryan for teaching me that. Uh, you'll hear more about that tomorrow. Um, so life is joy and suffering. There is no one without the other. And so it, we pursue life when we read. We are transformed as a consequence of our phenomenal experience and our living in the world. And that's how I would answer that. As far as those texts that challenge us or we don't want to finish, I think that our practice is, uh, we have to account for that. And um, we make those decisions, we are discerning and part of measuring that and gauging that is really important and it's unique and it's individualized in that way and it affects others, which is why like, I'm likening it to breath. But I think that there is an individual aspect to our own care and practice of our own reading and breath. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know if that helps. <laughs> Gareth, I'm waiting for you to jump in and say, I disagree with everything you said. You're welcome. Well, well, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm just um, I might do it later, but, but not today. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, Jessica, I want to say one thing that's going to sort of respond to um, Ryan and Christy, and that is that the, the part of your dissertation that talks about reluctant readers or the resistance to reading um and your audience for this project involves the fact that i also had a moment when i was teaching as a graduate student a literature course to undergraduates who weren't reading or or wanted immediate understanding and we were discussing you know metaphors and and they were just going at me like oh you just want to read something into everything and i'm like well, yeah, there is, it's not just a surface here where, it, you know, it, it goes further. 
And the thing is that I discovered is I stopped what I was doing and I said, we need to have a conversation about reading. Reading takes work. And that's why you don't want to do it. It's work, but so is breathing. If you've ever walked up a hill or tried to run up a hill, your breathing is labored. It's hard. And so there is an accumulative effect of learning to read that is connected directly to the bottle, the embodied notion of breathing and, and breathing is hard when you are walking up a hill, when you are adding other um, parameters to the reading situation. And so when students or anybody, and we have reluctant readers now um, in all political stripes, in legal, legal texts even, and it's called being ignorant. And I say that because there's a verb lurking in the word ignorant and it's to ignore. Mm -hmm. And so when people ignore something that they're reading because they don't agree with it or don't even want, they just dismiss it, there is an active bodily um, response there too. So that's just a way by way of connecting what Christy and Ryan were talking about. And as an audience, it doesn't have to be undergraduates in the first semester of college who are reluctant to read or resist reading. It can go all the way up to the president of the United States. Enough said. And I will implicate myself in that too. And I'm, I'm, I'm the audience for my dissertation as much as anybody else. Josh. Yeah, um, I don't have, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say that I'm very interested in reading what you wrote because I actually had a very similar problem to what you have. As you know, I had until I joined Book Oblivion, I never read literature for the most part, and it's because from from my birth until after I even finished and got my bachelor's in, in college, <clears throat> I did not know how to process what I read. And so reading, uh, you know, history stuff, mathematics, physics was easy because I knew what to do with that stuff. You know, you learn it so you can apply it. But when I was in, I had a very good English teacher in high school and they would ask, you know, we would read and they'd ask you know, the usual questions, you know, and I had absolutely no idea what, he was talking about. And then I went to college and I, you know, I had to take an English course, but I did not know how to read literature because I didn't know what to do with what I was reading. Yeah. And so uh, it's only when I joined your course and with the help of Steve and et cetera, that I finally said, oh, you know, I'll just stick with it. And over time I developed, you know, the critical skills to at least get something out of it and talk with other people. But before that, I was totally and in school. I was at, I was really clueless, you know, I could do the exams, but I had no idea how to ask those how to answer those questions that the English teachers would ask. So that's why I'm very interested in, in what you have written and researched. I appreciate that. I think uh, when you first came to our Book Oblivion conversations, you were attracted to the theoretical texts and those ideas. Uh, Joe Suzuki is here today, and he was the first professor to introduce me to like those dense theoretical texts. And even though like I could sound out words and I was reading, um, what was really freeing about reading those texts is that none of my colleagues understood them well. Um, a friend who's here also, she did. And I was able to like see other people do really amazing things with those texts, but there was a kind of poetry to it where I could come to it without expectation, whereas literature had certain interpretations, like you could only do so much with certain readings. And I really was attracted to the literature that was so dense and hard to understand that you didn't have one way to read it. But I think that's what attracted me to the theory early on. And so I just kept going. And like you said, it's an accumulate, accumulative effect. And that's Cynthia's point as well. And so that was really freeing to me. And I think that's part of what attracted me to the theoretical text so early on. So thank you to Joe Suzuki. OK, 
Twitter is who's here. You just turned on your camera. She was uh, one of the few who also was really inspired by the theoretical texts we read. And so, and Ellie here too. Um, I think it's, it's a gift to share those ideas. And it was really uh, formative back then. Still is. <laughs> All right, then if there's no any other question, I think we will have the private meeting with Jessica to discuss the details of the dissertation. Thanks for joining us. That was an amazing discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.